Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So it's good to be back up here. We are going to be in Matthew 26, page 809. If you're using the chair Bibles, let's go ahead and be turning there. We're going to start in verse 31. I want to so I want to give you the sermon title, and normally the sermon titles are not a big deal. Um, today, um, the sermon title is, How to Prepare for When All Hell Breaks Loose. So it's been about nine months since I told you, or since you heard about my family falling. So for those of you who don't know that story, I will recap briefly. It was about a week before Christmas. We were at my brother's house. We were celebrating Christmas. We were going to open gifts. My mom and my brother and his wife were there. It's, there, it's at his house. And we, we gather with all, my, all four of my daughters, their husbands, and the two grand, grand boys. We are about to take a group picture on the back deck. It's about, it's around lunchtime, maybe a little later. And we're all, you know how you do, you all squeeze in, and, and, you're, and, and you got somebody trying to do the camera. Well, that was unfortunately me. So it's on a tripod, and there's the phone there, and I'm trying to somehow figure out how to make it take a picture with this. And so in the pause of the moment, the next thing I remember is I'm sitting on the ground 15 feet below on the ground because the deck was elevated. And it had done a trap door, and all but my mom, 14 of the 15 of us fell, 15 feet. And as I become alert of what's going on, I hear moans and cries and wails. And I turn around and I just see bodies twisted and, and piled and potting soil covering my month, few month old child. It was a traumatic experience, to say the least. And I'm grateful to God that it wasn't near as bad as it could have been and that most of them are mostly recovered. Some of them are all recovered. Some of them didn't have any. Um, even two of my grandboys are good, and they're here even today. And so I'm really grateful to God and grateful to the prayers and the support of this church. The reason I bring that story back to you, though, is when you title a sermon, How to Prepare for When All Hell Breaks Loose, you better have some idea of what, that, what you're saying because that's a, 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 an audacious title otherwise. But the reality is some of you have had things happen in your life that were way worse you may even be going through that now. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a physical trauma to be traumatic and difficult. And how in the world do you prepare for that? And so I'm going to walk you through this passage that Je where Jesus is about to head into the most traumatic thing to ever happen on planet Earth, probably. Certainly on a spiritual dimension, if you throw it all together. But my hope is that you will leave better prepared or at least better informed on how to prepare yourself for whatever God lets happen in your life because God let that happen in our lives. He could have stopped it. He also could have let it be a lot worse. So, um, you know, these, these are hard things to think about. Jesus is going to the cross, and we're going to see in the passage that God himself, God the Father, sent Jesus to go through what he's going to go through and what we're going to read about in the coming weeks as we finish up the book of Matthew. So let's go ahead and turn to verse 31 there in chapter 26. And let's, uh, I, I want to point out, really I'm just going to point out two things today that I think will help us. And I'm going to use, I'll just wait till I get to it. All right, so starting in verse 31, Matthew writes, Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. Okay, what night is that? This is still, where we, it's right where we left off last week, okay? We're in the upper room. They've just had, celebrated the Last Supper, which we saw Jesus transform into the Lord's Supper or communion or Eucharist or however you call it. And he explains why. And, and so we are continuing that Thursday night interaction in the upper room. Tomorrow, Friday, will be Good Friday, not so good for Jesus, right? Because that's the day of the cross. It's the day of mock trials and betrayals to play out. It's, it's, the, day, it, it, it's the day for him when all hell breaks loose. But he's prepared. And he's going to help us prepare. Okay? So he says, 
Um, this very night you will all fall away. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the 12 minus 1 disciples because Judas is left to betray him. He'll, he'll reappear one more time, two more times, and then he'll be out of the story having fulfilled whatever it is he was supposed to fulfill, certainly to betray Jesus. Fall away. What does that mean? And this isn't a, this isn't a verse talking about salvation. I don't think. I think it's just saying they had faith, and in that moment, their faith failed them. Okay? Or better yet, their confidence in the one in whom they trust failed them. Okay? So I think we all could probably identify with this idea of something traumatic happens in our lives, and we're tempted to quit believing. We're just scared to death or whatever other emotions. And, and this, is the, this is the battle, right? When we are... When we're in a situation where things are going sideways, we're tempted to feel and respond in a way that doesn't communicate the faith that we say we have. And, and this is what we, we don't want this, right? We want to do the right thing when we know what the right thing is to do, even when we're tempted to do the wrong thing. And in fact, most of us could probably identify with Paul. I think in Romans 7, he says things like, I wish I could, would do what I want to do and not do what I don't want to do. But I end up doing what I don't want to do and not do what I want to do. I think I said that right. We can relate. I I can relate. Okay, let me just be transparent. I can relate to that every day, doing things I shouldn't do and didn't want to do and did it anyway. Okay? I'm probably famous on I-26 by now for all of my sign language. But anyway, you understand. All right. So this is very, all will fall away on account of me. For it is written, here's Jesus quoting Zechariah 13, 7, roughly, rough quote. This is Jesus taking the scripture and applying it to that day right there. And he says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Now let me just make a couple comments here and then I'll, I'll, I'll move to Peter here. I will strike the shepherd. Who is I? I is God, the Father. Who is the shepherd? God, the Son. Who are the sheep? Twelve disciples minus one. He's describing something that was written hundreds of years before it happened. So this is one of many, many messianic prophecies. And he's saying, God, the Father, is going to strike God, the Son, on purpose. The Son knows it's coming. And it's going to happen, and it's going to cause them to scatter. Some translations say stumble. Some say fall away. All the idea is they're going to, um, they're going to react in the flesh instead of by faith. Because Jesus doesn't do any of those things, even though he's the one that is struck. Okay? And that will play out in the days ahead next week probably, maybe the next Sunday when we get to that actual where that happens. I'll preach that piece as we continue to march through the book of Matthew. But today he's just telling them this is going to happen. Now, Jesus' track record on prophecy is good, right? He's like 100% so far, right? Well, they don't buy it. (laughs) They say, no, you're wrong, Jesus. But one other thing I want to point out in verse 32. Jesus is going to die on the cross. He knows this. They don't realize what he's saying yet, but he's saying this. And then he goes, after I have risen. In other words, I'm not going to be done when the cross happens. I will go ahead of you into Galilee, which also says this. They're going to be there too, even though they're going, to be, they're going to all scramble, scatter away from him at the moment he needs them most. Not only is he going to come through this, having resurrected, but he's going to, re- he's going to restore them. That should be encouraging for you and I. It's not the main mess- point of the message here, but let's just say this for a second. God is faithful and God forgives. Is that good news? That's good news. Because I need a God who's faithful to me even when I'm not faithful to him. And I need a God who forgives me because I have given him lots of reasons to forgive me. Because I certainly have needed it. Okay? And I don't think I'm alone. So, Peter replies. You know, of all the disciples, are you really surprised that it's Peter? Right? Peter replies, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I love that spirit. I love that conviction. And then Jesus replies with some somber words. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me 
Not once, not twice, but three times. So in just a few hours, Peter, you said you were willing, and Peter replies, but Peter declared, even if I die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. And yet, okay, so that's kind of setting up this next piece. So we're moving forward in the narrative. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. Gethsemane. This is the name of a garden. It's really a, an olive grove on the Mount of Olives. You may have heard of that. Um, if you are standing on the Mount of Olives and you're looking, I don't know which direction, if you're looking towards Jerusalem, there's a valley, Kidron Valley, and then you'll see the temple, and then you'll see the skyline behind it of Jerusalem. Old city Jerusalem with the temple, which is kind of closest to the Mount of Olives. That's what they're overlooking, okay? Okay. Now, it's night, so it's dark um, when he says, so, so they're going, they go, so he and the disciples, they, they have to hike down and hike back up to go up there. And, and Jesus would oftentimes go here to pray, which is what he's getting ready to do. So he tells him, he says, sit there while I go, sit here while I go there and pray. Who's he talking to? He tells of the 11 remaining disciples, he tells eight of them to stay right here. Because then he's going to say, he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, okay, that's James and John. He says, you three come with me. Come along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Wonder why. Then he said to them, the three, the three that he said, come away from the other guys. He didn't even tell the other guys to pray. He just said, you guys stay over here. And then he calls these three to come with him. These are the three he's closest to. These are the three he's invested the most in. These are the three he has shared the most in with. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Okay? So he's grieving like someone who has lost the closest person in their lives to death but he's grieving because of what's coming. And it's not just the physical torture he's going to endure before the cross. It's not just that plus the cross. It's there's, there's something that is going to happen that we don't really understand, but this relationship within God between Father and Son, where the Father is sending the Son to die for the sins of the world, and somehow in that period of time between the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, in that period of time, there is some kind of barrier between the Father and the Son that has never existed before and will never happen again. Okay? I don't understand it. I'm hesitant to even say that they're not... I I, I don't even want to describe because this is way, way over our heads. Okay? But there's a gulf that exists for a few days that is unprecedented in all of eternity in both directions. Go infinitely into the past. Jesus is the Son and the Father have never been separated. Go infinitely into the future. They will never be separated again. But in some sense, there is some relational barrier that is so unique and so overwhelming that he is he's feeling just, just well, overwhelmed with sorrow. They don't understand it. We don't understand it. We can only begin to scratch the surface of what that feels like, but that's where he is. And, and we will learn from Luke that this distress is so intense that he won't just be sweating as he's praying, which would be something for me to pray so much that I'm sweating, but he sweats drops of blood. And there's a medical condition, I can't quote the name of it, that actually that actually can happen. And he does that in the course of his praying. He says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. This is verse 38. And then he tells them, stay here, you three. Stay here, keep watch with me. Okay? That with me is, I, I'm not, I don't want to be alone, but I don't want to be right here, right here with you because he's getting ready to go over there. Going a little farther, verse 39. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed. This is the only time we see Jesus bowing. I think in his life, physical life. Of course, he's praying to his father, but he's not just, he's not bowing like to a king. He's bowing desperate. He is just like, I need you like I've never needed you. This human body thing is really, really intense. My father, if it is possible, 
He is asking for something. He is praying to God the Father and asking for something that the Father will not give him. And he probably knows this, and yet he's asking. That's how intense this is. If it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. What's the cup? It's, it's, it's the symbolic cup of wrath of God. Throughout the Scriptures, Old and New Testament, the cup is, a, is, a, is like a um, slang for the wrath of God. Imagine a goblet or a giant chalice full of wine. And the wine represents the wrath of God poured out, right? Because God is holy and God therefore must punish sin and he will punish sin and he will set things right, okay? All the injustices in the world that you see will be dealt with. All the injustices in all of history will be dealt with. The wrath of God is thorough and perfect and holy and appropriate. And oh, by the way, none of us really deserve not receiving the wrath. We all deserve the wrath of God for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. And that's the bad news before we give the good news of the gospel. That's why the gospel is good news because when you understand and believe the bad news that we deserve the wrath of God, well, that makes the good news actually sound good. My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Please, if there's any other way, basically, is what he's saying. Yet, not... My will, not as, not as I will, but as you will. Okay? Now, this is, this is huge. This is a huge part of today, okay? So let's not miss this. All right? Jesus is saying in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, what I want, but what you want, your will be done. That's what needs to happen here. Now, we know what he wants. He wants any other way but the cross. But he also wants to, more so even than that, Obey his daddy, which is what got us in trouble in the other garden, the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve are there. Their daddy said, you can have anything to eat you want in the whole wide world except for one tree. It'd be like leaving your kids at home for the weekend and saying, you can eat anything in the house except for my Coke in the back corner of the fridge. Don't you touch my Coke. I'm talking about Coca-Cola, okay, so don't, don't be alarmed. Coca-Cola, and uh, you come back, and there's still some food in the house, but there's no Coca-Cola in the back corner of the fridge. You know, kind of like you had one job. This is where we were in the garden. And in the garden, it wasn't not my will, but yours be done. It was not yours, but my will be done in the garden, wasn't it? And while it's real easy for us to look at Adam and Eve and go, ah, shame on you guys. Folks, if we had been in their place with a perfect mind that they had, without any blemish of sin on our, on our lives, we would have given in to that temptation eventually, if not right away. That's why we're reaping the fruit of that. Because there's not one person here, I don't believe, that's ever existed aside from Jesus that could have lived a sinless life without his intervention Yet not as I will, but yours be done. This is the verse of surrender. So when you think of surrender, I always think of war movies or, or movies, period, where somebody, you know, it's like somebody gets in the other and they got a gun and you, they like, drop it and they catch it. So you have to drop everything in your hands and put your life in the hands of the person with power. That's what surrender is, okay? Even if they're the bad guy, you don't have a choice. They're holding the gun. You drop the treasure, if it's a you know, treasure movie, you drop your weapons and they now have control and you're surrendering to them. Now, you didn't have to do that. You could have tried to make a run for it and they could have shot you or whatever, but this is surrender, right? But what we're talking about here is surrendering to the one who has ultimate power, but he's not your enemy. Well, it depends, actually, doesn't it? We all started out as enemies, born enemies, And by the grace of God, some of us have received the mercy that allows us, our eyes of our heart to be opened and to believe that actually his way is the way to life, even though few find it. And so if you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior and Lord, if you haven't believed that his way, that he is the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father but through him, then actually you are still an enemy of God. Romans 5 actually says that. 
This is why I love Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates His love in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So while we were traitors, and that's why I love that video, because nothing can separate us from the love of God once you've received it. But you do have to receive it, right? It's like the Christmas present under the tree. It's got your name on it, tag, it's yours, but it's not yours until you open it. You don't enjoy it. You don't receive it until you open the package see what it is, and, and know that that's yours, okay? And the gift of eternal life, it's, it's there. So this is one of two poles or, or two ends of a, well, let's just use a, uh, Brian does such a great job on the violin, let's just use a, a violin string, okay? A violin string, if it has no tension on it, is not making any noise. It's just going to be a flopping around, just a coil or wire. It's not doing anything that's... Uh, you can, you know, there's nothing. If you pull it, it begins to, t and have tension, you can begin to thump it, and it starts to ring a note. And the more you pull, the more of a note. And so what you do is you anchor it on each end with screws or, or whatever you call those things, the technical terms, and, and you can tighten or loosen to tune the string, okay? And the tighter it is, the higher the pitch goes, the note goes higher and higher. And if you go too far... It breaks eventually. It just pulls and snaps. If it goes too loose, it's just flopping around. Okay? I want you to imagine that what we're wrestling with right now when, when we're tempted is how do I respond in that moment? And one of those poles, one of those ends is surrender. Okay? It's living a life surrendered. It's like I'm going to live as if there's nothing I can do about it. I'm going to live as if all I need to do is trust God. That's a good place to be, right? Trusting God. Okay, well, that's on this side. Let me read a little further, and I want to give you the other side. Then he turned, and he's already said it. He's going to say it again. Then he returned to his disciples, the three, and he found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Here's the other side. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation, right? So we have surrender where we're living and we're just trusting God with everything. The other extreme implies preparation. It implies effort on my part. It's almost like the other extreme would be um, I've got to do it because no one else is. I'm going to work as if it all depends on me. I'm going to act as if it all depends on me. Over here, I'm going to act as if it all depends on God. Okay? Two extremes that can get us in trouble because the sweet spot is somewhere in between. And everybody's a little different, right? We all, some of you are really pretty good at trusting God, and some of you are really good at making things happen. I don't need God is the extreme, right? And I don't need to do anything, as you see. So what, what we want is somewhere in between where we are, we are recognizing the value of both of these pieces. And I this is, if you ask the question, what's, okay, Darren, what's this about? How do we prepare for when hell's about to break loose? How do we prepare for that? You prepare by working both ends towards the middle, tuning the line, the string of your life, so that somewhere in between you're embracing both Trusting God by surrendering fully to Him and working at it with all your heart. With all your heart. Loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You hear the effort part? See, grace isn't about effort. Grace is about earning. I think Tim Keller said that. He said, you know, just because we want to live by grace doesn't mean we don't do anything. Absolutely we do things. That takes effort. But I'm not earning any, I'm not doing it to earn anything, okay? So that's kind of where I see this as, as, as he goes. And so let, let me, so this, then he says this. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I love Jesus' grace here towards Peter. Peter has said, I'm not going to deny you, even if I die. I'm not going to die, deny you. I'm not going to give up on you. I'm, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be faithful. And Jesus is like, I appreciate that zeal, that conviction, and I believe you really believe that, Peter. But I know that that's not going to play out the way you think it is. The spirit is willing. The human spirit is talking about. 
Your spirit, every one of us, a unique spirit in us. Our, your spirit is willing, Peter, but your flesh is weak. And even though, Je and Jesus has prayed for him. In fact, if you go back, I'm not sure which of the Gospels. Jesus says, Satan has uh, tried or asked to sift you like wheat. I think, I, I can't remember, Luke maybe? And, and he said, but I prayed for you. Can you imagine that? Jesus, I prayed for you by name. Well, he's doing it all the time. He's interceding right now. So as cool as that sound in the moment, it's true for all of us, in his, all of, of his people. So he says, but the flesh is weak. We are new creatures in Christ, yes, but this costume we call the human body is temporary, and it is still infected with the effects of sin. And that's why we do stuff we don't want to do, and we don't do stuff we do want to do, because we still have this battle going on. And we need to prepare for how we deal with temptation when things go crazy by learning to embrace both the surrender, the surrender of, yet uh, not my will but yours be done, and the watch and pray, watch and pray, watch and pray. Think about a watch and pray sounds like a sentry on the top walls of a castle. They're watching, they're scanning, the, they're continuously scanning the horizon, looking for any sign of, of the enemy, okay? And they're praying, they're in constant communication with their general. They're constantly listening and speaking and giving updates, okay? And this is the way we are to live. We are to live um, on guard, but not so on guard that we're stressed to the max either. You know, it's, there's this, con this confident surrender that says, God is able and God is with me, and therefore I don't need to be afraid. And then there's the, but I'm going to feel that way because not only I know he loves me and I can, nothing can separate me from that love, but I also know he's given me instructions on how to live. Are you following the instructions? And, you know, if I could squeeze those into five minutes, I'd tell you all the instructions, but he kind of put it in a book for us so we could get, you know, just focus on the last third of the Bible if you've got nothing le left to do. If you're running out of time, focus on the Gospels and look at Paul's letters and learn from Peter's letters and the examples he gives us. But he tells us how to live. But basically, it's walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, trusting Jesus, keeping him at, at your eyes on him. Keep your eyes on Jesus, the author of Perfectory of Faith. The youth pastor I used to volunteer with back in, down in Florida used to say, keep the sun in your eyes, S-O-N. I like future so bright, got to wear shades, because if the sun is in your eyes, you know. Anyway, he didn't say that. Keep the sun in your eyes. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 is what that's about, right? Let me read that. I didn't tell him in the back. I, I refer to this a lot, and that's why I want to read it instead of assuming that you know it. All right, here we go, 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Keep, your sun, keep the sun in your eyes. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and it keeps going fixing our eyes on Jesus, and, and that's the, I want to do, I want to follow the leader, but I don't always have the power to do that. Oh, yes, I do. The Holy Spirit in me, God in me, I can do. So my ability to resist temptation is, is I have it. Okay? Well, how do I know what's sin and what's not? Again, it's knowledge of the Word of God, and if we had time, I would take you to Matthew 4. And if you remember, months ago when we preached through Matthew 4, Jesus is in the wilderness, 40 days he's been fasting, and then Satan comes along and starts tempting him and tempts him three different ways, and Jesus combats the temptations with what? The Word of God. Okay? With this. To do that, you have to be familiar with this, don't you? You have to know it. You have to have immersed yourself in it. You have to have prayed it and read it and heard it and meditated on it and memorized it, studied it, getting a good grip on it, right? So it's not in this passage, but it is certainly in this passage by looking at Matthew 4. Jesus did that. And so he was prepared. And so when he is arrested later, he won't run and he won't freak while the others do. My father, he went away a second time, 
So Jesus is okay with you asking a prayer more than once because he repeats himself. And so I figure if it's good enough for Jesus. My father, if it is, this time he says not. It's almost like he sees where this is going. But just in case, father, if, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. That's different. That's, if it's not possible and this is going to happen, then I want your will to be done as a result of my obedience by grace through faith. So Jesus is modeling for us preparation. Watch and pray, coupled with surrender to Almighty God. This is what he's calling you and I. Are you, how, how's the tune of your string right now? Is your, is your string flopping around because it doesn't, it's unanchored in the Word? Is it so tight that it's about to pop because you're, you're leaning way too much one way or the other? Ask God to help you evaluate. This is what you do. This is your response. Our response time is a time for you to respond to God and listen and say, God, what are you trying to say to me today? What, do I gonna, what am I going to do about it? What are you saying to me? What do you want me to do about it? What are you saying to me? What do you want me to do about it? Those are the two diagnostic questions to be asking yourself when you're reading the Word, when you're hearing the Word, when you're studying the Word, and so forth. Spirit is willing. Not possible. Verse 43. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third, a third time, saying the same thing. So he asked for the same thing three times. If there's any way, other way, please do it. If not, either way, your will, not mine, be done. Okay? Contrast with the Garden of Eden. Then he returned to the disciples, and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man, referring to himself, is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. And that's where we'll pick it up next time in verse 47. Jesus is going to be arrested. He'll be taken through the mock trials. Okay? 1886, actually all August 31st, so this month, 137 years ago, the great earthquake of Charleston. You may not have heard this. If you're from the Midwest, earthquakes happen here too. Okay? I don't know where they happen in the Midwest. They happen in the Midwest? Or is it just tornadoes? They do? And so, earthquake. So it was so strong on the Richter scale, almost 7.9 to 7.3. Epicenter was Hanahan. Anybody live in Hanahan? <laughs> Sorry. You're on, on the epicenter of that earthquake. And uh, it was so strong that they felt it in Boston, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, uh, New Orleans, and Cuba even. Okay. Yeah. So it's strong and did lots of damage. And, of course, this was 1886, so there are not any high-rises, really. And, but people died, and they've been talking about, you know, the next one's, you know, we're overdue for another one. So why do I tell you that? So this is going to sound a little silly, but this is one way I've prepared. I'm in my wife's car and in my car. There is a, each a backpack. And in that backpack is like a bottle of water, maybe a, two bottles, a couple of packs of snacks, a hat, a flashlight, a coat or jacket, just some basic you never know kind of things. Be prepared bag because you never know. Just imagine with me that you're at Barnes & Noble at Town Center in Mount Pleasant. It's probably about, you know, you're you just over there Saturday afternoon and you're like, I just want to go into a bookstore because they're really hard to find now. And you're perusing the, the books and uh, drinking some coffee, and there's an earthquake in Charleston. And what will they do pretty quickly after an earthquake in Charleston? They'll close the bridges. And if they close the bridges, then you're probably not going over those bridges anytime soon, at least in your car. And if you try to drive around Charleston because of all the rivers and everything, you're going to have to drive way out and then trying to get back on all these two-lane roads that everybody else will be trying to do the same thing with. So that's probably not plan A, although you might try that. Plan B could be, I'm going to walk. So I live in Somerville on the Knightsville side of town, so it's about 35 miles to walk from Barnes & Noble to my house, 35 miles. No big deal. 
just takes 11 or 12 hours under ideal conditions with no stops. That doesn't sound so appealing all of a sudden. Then imagine that you're going to be walking at least some of it in the dark. And because the cell towers are likely out, you probably aren't going to be able to GPS the shortest route. You might have some idea, but the range of different routes was three miles difference. And so all of a sudden, you start putting in stops, and you realize, I'll probably get hungry. I'll probably get thirsty. Under ideal circumstances, the stores are open. I can get something to eat or drink, but I may not be able to do that under those crazy circumstances. You see where I'm going with this? Just a little bit of preparation. It's not a big deal. Probably not. It might not even make a difference. But because I put a little bit of thought with some help from other people and put together just a few things, with my wife rolling her eyes as I put the bag in the back of her trunk and say, just forget it's there until you need it. I hope you never need it. There it is. It's done. Okay? Now, that's a small, silly example of what we're really talking about on the watch and pray side of things, right? Because I'm praying she never needs that bag. Or if that happens, that she's at home. Or you know what I'm saying? But if we're not at home, if we are at home, we're probably wanting to go check on the grandkids, right? So how do we get there? You see what I'm saying? How are we going to prepare when all hell breaks loose? We do some things that we can control and trust God with the rest. Yeah. That's all we're saying. This part doesn't come naturally. It doesn't come easy to those of us who are children of God. But you can't walk with God unless you trust Him. And so I'm asking you, if you haven't done that, there's no better way to prepare. You don't have to have a go bag in your trunk to be prepared if you have the Lord in your heart. And so with that, I want to pray and end. Lord, I just pray right now for those in the room that maybe don't have a relationship with you right now. They've never set the record straight in their own hearts that they trust you for their life starting right now into eternity. Maybe they're trusting in bank accounts. Maybe they're trusting in all their connections or their insurance policies or they've got a great location for their house and they're really protected there. Or, Lord, we know how bad things can get. Well, actually, we probably don't. But, Lord, they can get so bad that we're left with nothing but you. Lord, I just pray that we would have you in our hearts set, settled, so that we might know that there's always hope because you're with us. And therefore, I do not need to be afraid. Lord, we will find ourselves in temptation situations where we're tempted to despair and be afraid. I pray, God, you would help us prepare and trust you. Prepare as if it all depended on us and trust you as if it all depended on you. Help us to wed those two and have the right tension on the string so that we might please you in the meantime. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for watching today. It's our hope that as a result of today that you'll grow in your desire to become the best neighbor ever where you live, work, and play. Uh, We also hope that you'll like and subscribe to the video if that's helpful and maybe even share it with others. Now, for more information about our church or our online ministry, you can go to gracetoday.net slash contact and you can leave a comment and tell us how God's working as a result of the ministry that we've been doing or how we can help you if if there's a need. Um, That's gracetoday.net slash contact. And finally, if you just want to know more about how to trust and follow Jesus, you can text me. My phone is 843 830-2464. That's 843-830-2464.